Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. If our gentlemen will please rise for the dawning of the Talitot. And if somebody will move the slides for me real quick. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified, uh, who sanctified us with your commandments and commanded us to wrap ourselves in tzitzit. Amen. The Hebrew is the easy part. The English came up at just the right time. So we want to welcome everyone this morning to Congregation Mayim Chaim. Those joining us online, we say Shabbat Shalom to you guys as well. We pray that our service this morning is a blessing to you guys. Uh, I know worship is going to be awesome. I know liturgy is going to be awesome. Uh, the message should be okay. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're excited to be here. We're excited to worship with you guys. We thank you, Danielle and I and our family. Thank you guys for your grace and mercy and uh, uh, allowing us to be gone last week. We were going to be gone whether you allowed it or not, but allowed us to be gone last week as we were uh, out of state for a family emergency. Uh, and we thank you guys for praying for our family uh, throughout all of this. We are glad to be back and to be here with you guys in worship, in unity, in person. Uh, so I want to encourage you this morning, just give God free reign in this place. Let's let him breathe his breath of life upon us. Let his ruach move among us. And let's uh, make sure that we are completely and totally open to what the Lord wants to do in this place today. Amen. If you'll join with me as we open with prayer, and then we'll hand it off to Diane for liturgy. Avrahamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, Lord. We thank you, God, that you have allowed us to gather today on your holy Shabbat, that you have allowed us to awaken this morning, breathing your breath of life and uh, being able to stand and worship you as one body. Lord, I pray that as we enter into worship today, that our hearts will be humbled before you, that we will leave everything happening in our day-to-day -day lives, everything happening in the world around us, all the crazy going on all over the globe on the outside of this building, so that while we are in here, we are focused on you, on encountering you, and on hearing from you. Lord, I pray that you move mightily in our midst today, and that you have your way in our worship. Hashem Yeshua Meshachinu. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray, and everyone says, Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Matovu o halecha Yaakov Mishkenotecha Yisrael Matovu o halecha Yaakov Mishkenotecha Israel, ma tovu o halecha Yaakov, mishkenotecha Israel, vani berov chazdecha avov etecha. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. O Lord, through your abundant kindness, I will enter your house. In awe, I will bow down toward your holy sanctuary. Baku et Adonai, Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Le'olam Va'ed Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Baruch Abba Hashem Adonai Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natan Lano Et Derek HaYeshua B'Mashiach Yeshua Amen 
Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Ashrei Yoshve Vetecha, Od Yahalucha Sela, Ashrei Ha'am Shekakaloho, Ashrei Ha'am She Adonai Elohav. Happy are those who dwell in your house, they are ever praising you. Happy are the people that are so situated. Happy are the people whose God is Adonai. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Speak also unto the children of Israel, saying, Above all, my Sabbaths you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Mi chamocha b'yelim Adonai Mi chamocha nedar b'kodesh no hora tehilot, o se fele, o se fele. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you? Glorified in holiness, you are awesome in praise, working wonders, O Lord, who is like you, O Lord. If you will all turn and face east. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Malchuto, Leolam Fahed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. But the Pharisees, when they heard that Yeshua had silenced the Sadducees, gathered together in one place. And testing him, one of them, a lawyer, asked, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the Torah? And Yeshua said to him, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And have these words which I command you this day be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you retire and when you arise. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and let them be frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. Ve'ahavta l'reicha chamocha and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The entire Torah and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You may turn back around.
doesn't help trouble And I got him out he's with us God of Jacob is our Lord Say la, say la And I got him out he's with us God of Jacob is our fortress Say la, say la, say la One in truth, 
One with each other, Lord. One with you. We kiss us with the same love. We kiss for sure. Kiss us with the same love. You kiss for sure. Kiss us with the same love. You kiss for sure. This is with the same love. You kiss your shoe away. Make us one, Lord, one for the glory of your Son. Make us one, Lord, one with the glory of your love. Make us one, Lord, one. Lord, one with the glory of your love. Let's go back to that bridge again. Let this be our prayer today. Lord, make us one. One in spirit. One in truth, one with each other, one with you, one in spirit, one in truth, one with each other, Lord, one with you, kiss us with you kiss for sure. Kiss us with the same love. You kiss for sure. Kiss us with the same love. You kiss for sure. Kiss us with the same love. You kiss for sure. Make us one, Lord, one, for the glory of your Son. Make us one, Lord, one, with the glory of your love. Make us one, Lord, one, for the glory of your Son. She was prayer for us in John 17, 17. That we would be one in a world that's so broken up, so torn apart today. She was praying for us. He's forever our intercessor.
is with us. Oh, come behold the works of God, the name. He breaks the tempo and bends the spirit. Though a 
Galatians 4. The oceans roar of the Lord of all. The one who calms the wind and waves makes my heart be still. The earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea, the nations rage. I know my God is in control. The ocean roar, you are the Lord of all. The one who comes the wind and waves, makes my heart be still. The earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea, the nations rage, I know my God is in control, Lord of hosts, your wings, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the this battle Oh, where else would we go with the Lord of hosts You are with us, with us in the fire With us as a shelter With us in the storm You will lead us through the fiercest battle
heart becomes free Shame is undone Presence born Holy Spirit You are welcome Come fly
firm foundation I will put my trust in you alone I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love It is a firm foundation None beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love to those around me And I will build my heart on your There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. sing this as our commitment, as our dedication today. I will build my life on your love. Is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you no one like you, none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder, and show me who you are, and fill me with your heart, and lead me in your love to those around me.
Rafaeno Adonai, vene Rafae. Hoshieno, vene Vashea. Kiti Hilateno Ata, Vahale Rafua, Shala Amalekho Makutenu, Ki El Melek Rofe Ne Eman Ve Rachimanata, Barukata Adonai Rofe Tole Amo Yisrael. Heal us, O Lord, and we shall be healed. Save us, and we shall be saved. For the one we praise is you. Bring complete healing for all our sicknesses, O God, for you are our faithful and compassionate healer and king. Blessed are you, O Lord, the healer of the sick of Israel. At this time, I would like to ask each of you to lift up the name of your loved ones, the names of those that you know that are in need of healing, in need of deliverance, that need hope, that need to know the truth, that needs the peace that passes all understanding. For those that are trusting in their finances and not you, Father, I, lift, I ask for you to lift those up. Father, I pray Lord, you are holy. You are beautiful. You are wonderful. As believers, we know you. Or we are getting to know you. We look to you, Father, as the answer to all of our needs. All of our prayers. Father, we know so many, though, that do not know where to look for the answers. They do not know where to look for true healing of our spirit, our souls, and our bodies. They do not know that there is a battlefield raging in their minds. They do not know that there is a war for their souls. Father, I pray that each of these names, each of our loved ones, Father, that they will come to know you, the healer of all of their infirmities. For those of us that do know you and are in need, Father, I ask for you to hear our prayers. There are those of us that are in need that don't even realize that we are in need. And Father, I ask that you make those clear to us so that those areas are areas that we can develop and grow closer to you. You are wonderful, Father. And my prayer is that each of these are mishpucha, our friends, our family, our acquaintances. That they will all see your glory, they will all see your light, and they will flock to you like the moth to the flame. Only they will not be burnt. They will be glorified by your Son. You are holy, Father. You deserve all of our praise. You deserve all all of our prayers. I worship you, Father, and I thank you. I thank you that you will answer these heartfelt prayers that are in your will. I thank you that you will meet the needs. I thank you that you will hear our hearts cry. I thank you that you will sit right beside us and wrap us in your arms. I thank you that you are our God, that you are my God. I thank you for forgiving me. 
I thank you for forgiving us when we feel unforgivable. I thank you for healing us when we doubt our ability to be healed. I thank you for being faithful when we are not. May you be glorified in this prayer. May your children be healed, delivered, sanctified. In the name of Yeshua Mashiach, I pray. Amen. Avino Avino Shabasha Mahayim Yit Kadesh Yit Kadesh Shimcha Talvo Machutka Yatzer Ratzoncha Kevasha Mahayim Kain Baharetz Our Father in heaven, sanctified by your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth will declare your praises. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu ve'elohe avoteinu Elohe Avraham Elohe Yitzchak Elohe Yaakov Hayel Hagador Hagibor ve'hanora El El Yon Go Mil Chazadim Tovim Ve'kone Hakov Ezekak Hazde Avot Ume Vego Elib Nevenehem Lema'an Shemo Be'ahava Melech Uzir Umashia Umagen Baruch atah Adonai Blessed are you, O Lord our God, and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, the great, mighty, and awesome God, the most high God, who bestows grace and creates all and remembers the righteousness of the fathers and brings a redeemer to their children's children for his namesake with love. O King, helper, savior, and shield, blessed are you, O Lord, the shield of Abraham. Atagi bor leolam adonai milchayem metim atarav lehoshia milchachel chayem bechesed milchayem metim barachamim rabim so homech noflim verofe choholim umati hirasorim umkahayem emunato holy sheneafa. Micha mocha ba'aguvarot umido mehelach melech memihi tum chayehe umatz miak yashua venehemanat ala hakayohot metim baruch ata adonai mechayehe ha metim. You, O Lord, are mighty forever. You raised the dead. You are mighty to save. You sustain the living with grace. Resurrect the dead with abundant mercy. Uphold the falling. Heal the sick. Set free those in bondage. And keep faith with those that sleep in the dust. Who is like you, master of mighty deeds? And who can compare to you, O king, who causes death and restores life and makes salvation sprout? And you are faithful to resurrect the dead. Blessed are you, O Lord, who resurrects the dead. The Karazel Azeve Emar. They were crying out to one another. Kadosh, 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 Adonai heights of Ohot, Melo Kahoaretz Kevodo, Baruch Kevod Adonai, Mim Kamo. I don't know. 
remain standing if you are in mourning or if this week marks the year anniversary of the death of a loved one. Please join me, join us in singing the Mourner's Kaddish. Yit kadah ve yit kadash me raba be alma de verach yurote vayam lich makote bechaye chon of yo me chon uf chaye de chol beit Israel 
Pa agala pa agala uvisma anka arive ve emru amen ye he shame raba me varach le alumul al me almaya yit barach yit barach hak ve ishta bak ve it pa ar ve it roman ve it nase ve it hada ve it ale ve it halal shame de kashabrich vu le elam in kol bechata ve shirata tush bechata ve nechemata da ami iram be ama ve emru amen. Yehi he shalom arabamin shemaya v'chaim aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael ve'emru ve'emru amen. O se shalom bimromav hu ya se shalom aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael ve'emru ve'emru amen. Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world which he has created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days and during the life of the whole house of Israel, even swiftly and soon, and say, Amen. Let his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. Blessed and praised, glorified and exalted, extolled and honored, magnified and lauded be the name of the Holy One, blessed be He. Though He be high above all the blessings and songs, praises and consolations which are ever uttered in the world, and say, Amen. May He who makes peace in His high places make peace upon us and upon all Israel, and say, Amen. Say shalom, be Roma. Oh, say shalom, be Roma. Ya se, ya se, ya se shalom. Who ya se, ya se, ya se shalom. Who ya se, ya se, ya se shalom. Alleluia. May the one, may the one who makes peace bring peace down, bring peace down. May the one, may the one who makes peace bring peace down, bring peace down. May the one, may the one who makes peace bring peace down, bring peace down. May the one, may the one who makes peace bring peace down, bring peace down. Please extend your hands toward our children.
as we say special blessing over them this Shabbat. Over our boys, we say Simcha Elohim Kef Rain Vek Menashe. Over our girls, Yismech Elohim Kesara Rivcha Rachel Velea. Yivarecha Chadonai Vishamrecha. Yardonai Panavelecha Vichu Necha. Yise Adonai Panavelecha Vesem Lecha Shalom. May the Lord make you like Ephraim and Menashe. May the Lord make you like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Avrahamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, Lord. We thank you for the children that uh, you have blessed this congregation to have in our midst. We thank you for uh, their lives, their hearts. We thank you for the opportunity to be a blessing to them and to live an example of Mashiach before them. Father, I pray for their parents, for their extended family, and for us as a congregation, as a mishpocha family in this community together, that uh, we will all live the example of Messiah before them in a way that draws them closer and closer to the Lord, that draws them closer and closer to being... Uh, uh, more of an image and likeness that we were created in, that they will experience your might and power in your presence, that they will know that you are real and that you are present in our lives, and that they will grow up hearing your voice and encountering you face to face as a man speaks to a man. Lord, we thank you for what you are doing in our children's lives and what we trust completely and in perfect faith you will continue to do as they grow in you. B'Shem Yeshua Meshachinu. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray, and everyone says, Amen. If everyone will please rise as we prepare for the uh, Torah procession. Uh, Stan, if you would come down to uh, open the ark and remove the Torah. And Chris, if you would come to carry the Torah this morning. Ibn Zuharon, they are mere Moshe, Kuma, Adonai, they are Funsu, Oivecha, they are Nusu, Misanecha, Mipone, Ki, Mitzion, Tetze, Toharam, Ki, Mitzion, Tetze, Toharam, Orevar, Adonai, Mirushalaim, Baruch, Shenotan, Torah, Torah, Baruch Shenotan, Torah, Torah, Leamo Israel, Begin to Shanto, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Echad Eloheinu, Gadol Adonenu, Kadosh Shemo, Gadru Adonai Iti, Une Rome Moshemo Yachdav. When the ark would travel, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and may your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee from before you. For from Zion will go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people, Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. One is our God, great is our Lord, holy is his name. Magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. In name How pleasant it is, brothers to dwell together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is, for brothers to dwell together in unity, in unity. 
eternity. Lie, 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 lie. In unity, in unity. Lie, 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 lie. Ine mato umanai, shebeta kingam yakat. Ine mato umanai, shebeta kingam yakat. Ine mato, ine mato. Lai 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 lai. Ine mato, ine mato. Lai 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 lai. Behold how good and how pleasant it is, brothers to dwell together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is, brothers to dwell together in unity, in unity. Lai 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 lai. In unity, in unity. Lai 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 lai. In the motto of my name. Shebeta kingam yakat ine matovu manaim. Shebeta kingam yakat ine matov ine matov. Lai 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 lai. Ine matov ine matov. Lai 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 lai. Behold how good and how pleasant it is, brothers to dwell together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is. Brothers to dwell together in unity, in unity. Lai 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 lai. In unity, in unity. Lai 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 lai. Lai 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 lai. Lai 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 lai. We have a unique tradition here at Congregation Maim Chaim where each week before we open up the uh, Torah scroll as a community, we read from Exodus 19 verses 16 through 19, what we call the Sinai experience or the, the Sinai account where the nation of Israel as a whole stood at the base of Mount Sinai and heard the audible voice of the Lord speak forth the Aseret Hadibrot, the ten words of the Ten Commandments. And it tells us in the passage that predicating the voice of the Lord came forth the sound of a heavenly shofar blast that I believe gripped the hearts and the minds of Israel in preparation for the voice of the Lord about to come forth. And here at CMC, we believe fervently that we serve a God who is alive and well. We believe that we serve a God who speaks to us as much today as he ever has in the history of creation, and that one of the primary ways he speaks to us is through his word. So we believe that each and every time we open up the word of God, we should be expecting to have our own personal Sinai experience. We should be expecting to hear the audible voice of the Lord speak forth from his word as we read. And so each week as we prepare to hear the Torah, uh, Parsha being read, we read this passage to remind ourselves what our forefathers experienced at, Israel, uh, at Mount Sinai, and then we blast this shofar in preparation for the voice of the Lord about to come forth from his word. Amen. You'll join with me. In the morning of the third day, there was thundering and lightning, a thick cloud on the mountain and the blast of an exceedingly loud shofar. All the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the lowest part of the mountain. 
Now the entire Mount Sinai was in smoke because Adonai had descended upon it in fire. The smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. The whole mountain quaked greatly. When the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with a thunderous sound. Blessed are you, o Lord, our, blessed, blessed, bless the Lord, the blessed one. Bless me. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. It's a lot easier if I just read what's on the slide in front of me. This week we read Parsha Vayichra from Leviticus 1, 1 through 5, 26. If you have a typical English translation like a KJV, NIV, NASB, something like that, it's uh, actually through verse 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 7, as opposed to the traditional Hebrew ordering, which is 5, verse 26 as the ending. In Hebrew we read, Vayichra el Moshe, Bereber Adonai elav, Meohel moed, Lemor de ber el b'nei Yisrael, Vayamarta elehem, Adam ki yachriv, Michem karban, La Adonai min, Hab hema, Min habachar, Umen hatzon, Tichravu et, Karbanachim, kar, karbanachim. And in English, now Adonai called to Moses and said and spoke to him out of the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to Bnei Israel and tell them, When any one of you brings an offering to Adonai, you may present your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. If his sacrifice is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to present a male without blemish. He is to offer it at the entrance of the tent of meeting, so that he may be accepted before Adonai, who is to lay, he is to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, so that it will be accepted for him to make atonement on behalf, on his behalf. He is to slaughter the bull before Adonai. Then Aaron's sons, the Kohanim, are to present the blood and splash it around on the altar that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us the Torah of truth and has planted eternal life in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Vezont Torah she samo she lifne bene Israel on piad onai beyad mo she This is the Torah that Moses placed before the sons of Israel at the command of Adonai by the hand of Moses Amen
Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who selected good prophets and was pleased with their words, which were spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, who chooses the Torah, your servant Moses, and your prophets of Israel, and pro your people Israel, and prophets of truth and righteousness. From Isaiah 43, the people I formed for myself so they may... Uh, Starts in the middle of a sentence. That's weird. Yet you have you have not called on me, Jacob, for uh, you have been weary of me, Israel. You have not brought me sheep for your burnt offerings, nor have you honored me with your sacrifices. I did not compel you to serve offerings, nor weary you with incense. You have not spent money buying me aromatic cane, nor have you satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. Rather, you burnt you burdened me with your sins, wearied me with your iniquities, I, I am the one who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. Remind me when we argue your case together, state your case so you may be proved right. Your first father sinned and your mediators rebelled against me. So I profaned the sanctuary officials and gave Jacob over to destruction and Israel to scorn. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, rock of all eternities, faithful in all generations, the trustworthy God who says and does, who speaks and makes it come to pass, all of whose words are true and righteous. Faithful are you, O Lord, our God, and faithful are your words, for not one word of yours is turned back unfulfilled, for you are a faithful and compassionate God and King. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God who is faithful in all his words. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua, and the commandments of the new covenant. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. From Romans 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Messiah Yeshua, for the law of the spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what was impossible for the Torah, since it was weakened on account of the flesh, God has done, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as a sin offering, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the Torah might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Ruach. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Ruach set their minds on the things of the Ruach. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Ruach is life and shalom. For the mindset of the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not submit itself to the law of God, for it cannot. So those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Ruach. If indeed the Ruach Elohim dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Ruach of Messiah, he does not belong to him. But if Messiah is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and has planted life everlasting in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. And when it rested, Moses would say, Return, Adonai, to the tens of thousands of the families of Israel. Arise, Adonai, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. It is a tree of life to those who take hold of it. And those who support it are praiseworthy. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Bring us back, O Lord, to you, and we shall come. Renew our days as of old. Amen.
You may be seated, and before we go forward, I just want to take a quick second and uh, and say thank you to all of those who helped make last week, last Shabbat, a, uh, a success. Um, we've come a long way in almost 10 years. This August will be 10 years that Maim Chaim has been in existence, and uh, it's taken us a long time to get to a point where uh, we know that everybody has everything under control, and if we have to leave for emergencies or whatever, that we know service will go on, that we know that uh, there will be a, uh, um, a, a personal ownership from our congregation and those involved in, uh, in the ministry here. And so we thank you guys uh, for taking up that, that extra slack and, uh, and making sure everything ran smoothly last week. Uh, I know there were a few little sound glitches, but that happens. Uh, it, it happens a lot when I'm in control of the soundboard. Uh, so we're, uh, you know, it is what it is. But the service last week was phenomenal. Um, thank you to Toby um, for uh, for being here and for leading uh, the the Torah service and, and the message and all. He did a phenomenal job. If you haven't listened to Toby's sermon for last Shabbat, uh, go listen to the podcast or watch the video again from last week. Uh, it was a very, very... Um, important message and uh, and I think very valuable so uh, take that time to go listen to that if you haven't already um, and thank you to everybody that made everything work so smoothly last week um, it really does mean a ton to us to know that uh, we can leave if need be for for whatever and that things will continue to run smoothly and be a blessing to uh, to our community here um, even if we're not here
a few moments, we are going to uh, receive our offering for the Shabbat, and you're going to have the opportunity to give to something that's making an eternal difference in this community. This is a part of our service when we get to respond to God's grace and goodness and God's goodness, and you have the opportunity to financially support the ministry of the synagogue. I want to invite you to go ahead and get ready for that now. While you're doing whatever is needed to, uh, to get ready to give your tzedakah, I want to read a, a short passage for you that comes from the book of Colossians. This is something that Rav Shaul or, or uh, Paul wrote to a Messianic congregation that existed way back in the first century. And here's what it says. Therefore put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, for that is idolatry. Because of such things, God's wrath is coming upon the sons of disobedience. That's from Colossians 3, 5 through 6. It's interesting to me that Paul listed greed up there with all the other evil desires. I mean, some of those other things seem considerably worse than, than greed, in, at least in my mind. But when you think about it, I mean, greed is like any other addiction. It functions just like addictions to drugs, alcohol, or sex. You never feel like you have enough. You always want more. And it's like a socially acceptable addiction in our society. You see people that have nicer cars and nicer houses or better jobs, and you want what they have. If we're honest in one way or another, we all have struggled or do struggle with this, don't we? The antidote to greed is generosity. When we live like it, is, like, uh, it all belongs to God, that's stewardship. And give like it all belongs to God, that's generosity. We, combi we combat the addiction of greed. We allow God the freedom to shape us into his image and to do his work in our hearts. I don't want you to be addicted to drugs. I don't want you to be addicted to alcohol or porn or approval or money or anything else. I want us to live free in God's grace and knowing God's goodness. So one of the reasons that I want you to give generously is to tear down the destructive addiction that greed has in our life. Because when that addiction is broken, you'll live in greater freedom. If you haven't given your tithes and offering already, or if you feel led to give more, we encourage you to give through the brand new Maim Chaim app or through our website at shlomeasternshore.com forward slash give. You can also give in person by dropping your uh, tithes and offerings in the Sadaka box in the back of the sanctuary. For those who have already given, we thank you and appreciate your blessing, the vision, and the work here at Maim Chaim. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who commanded us and made promises to us concerning the tithe and the offering. Avrahamim, Father of mercies, we thank you, Lord, for the resources that you have blessed us with. We thank you for meeting our needs above and beyond anything we could ever imagine. And Father, we thank you that you have called us through the resources you have placed in our hearts and our lives to give back unto you so that your name can be glorified before all people so that we can as a community take part together and seeing the good news of messiah go forward seeing hearts change seeing lives change and seeing people begin to understand the reality and the truth of messiah yeshua lord i thank you for uh what you have done in our congregation over these almost 10 years now how you have kept us sustained and floating, how you have kept us moving forward and progressing. Uh, and Father, I ask that as we continue to move forward in the calling you have assigned to us here on the Eastern Shore, that you will continue to give wisdom and knowledge to our leadership on how best to steward the resources that you bring in and how best to be an impact in the community around us and to our mishpacha, our family here in our congregation itself. B'Shem Yeshua Meshachinu, in the name of Yeshua our Messiah, we pray. And everyone says, Amen and Amen. At this time, we want to give you a couple of moments to wander about. Say Shabbat Shalom to each other. If you need to hit the Sadaka box, the restrooms, coffee, whatever, uh, now is a perfect opportunity to do so. And we'll come back together in about five minutes for the message.
right, if everyone will go ahead and make their way back toward their seats. Before I roll directly into the uh, the message uh, this week, uh, I guess this coming Tuesday, I will uh, finally be completely rid of this cast and moving into a walking boot. So I am looking forward to being able to uh, to at least be a bipedal again. Um, so it should be interesting as we uh, make our way in that direction being able to stand some again. I'll probably have to sit during the service for at least the first few weeks, but being able to, to move around without this thing would be phenomenal. <laughs> All right, so this week we are uh, reading Parsha Vayichra, which is the very first Parsha of the book of Leviticus, uh, and it is Leviticus 1.1 through 5.26, or as I said during the Torah service, if you have a traditional English translation, uh, it is uh, through ver chapter 6, verse 7. So those last few verses, 520 through 26, in the typical Jewish ordering, Hebrew ordering, in an English ordering is 6, 1 through 7. Uh, so as we're going through, if you're a little confused or lost, depending on what translation you're using, now you know where that little bit of a, a shift is. Um, and Parsha Vayichra, as we read through it, you'll notice, and I hope that you've had the time this week to, to actually go through and read through uh, the Parsha in advance of Shabbat. Um, but if, you, if you've read through it, you'll notice that it's full of a lot of very fine details, setting things up for the actual sacrificial system and the temple service, uh, or the, the tabernacle service, what would become the temple service. And the Parsha begins with the discussion on the Lord's command to only bring an offering before him that is without blemish. In other words, if you brought a lamb or a bull or a grain offering or whatever it was, you couldn't bring one that was already lame or, or damaged in any way or even marred up. Like if it ran itself across, you know, today, if you had your fencing out and you had a lamb and that lamb ran across the fencing and got a gash in its side, it's no longer qualified for being that offering, for being that korban. Uh, so it's got to be completely without blemish. And so uh, if you do this and you bring that, what you're ultimately doing is bringing to God what is the best that we have to offer, right? So we set aside in our offering as we were prepared to bring it to the tabernacle and later the temple, we set aside the best that we have to offer to the Lord, not the worst that we have, not the leftovers, not the stuff we don't think is valuable or couldn't make use of, so we might as well give it to the Lord. All in all, as we read through the Parsha, there are five total offerings and or sacrifices that are prescribed through this Parsha, through Parsha Vayichra. The first is the Ola, or the ascending offering, that is wholly raised uh, to God by fire atop of the altar. In other words, the entire offering is burnt up. Uh, the next is the Mincha, or the varieties of mill offerings prepared with fine flour, olive oil, and frankincense. Next is the shalamim, or the peace offering, uh, whose meat was eaten by the one bringing the offering after parts are burned on the altar and parts are given to the kohanim, or the priests. Uh, next is the chatat, or the, the various types of sin offerings, brought to atone for transgressions committed erroneously by the high priest, the entire community of Israel as a whole, the king, or even just the individual Israelite. The guilt offering, or the asham, was brought by one who had misappropriated property of the sanctuary, who is in doubt as to whether he has transgressed the divine prohibition, or who has committed a betrayal against God by swearing falsely to defraud a fellow man. And in reference to Leviticus 1, uh, verse 2, we, we read that it says, Speak to B'nai Israel and tell them, when, you, uh, when any one of you brings an offering to Adonai, you may present your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. The Hasidic masters say that the Hebrew of this verse can be translated or, or interpreted a little different. It's not just that a man of, uh, of you who shall bring near an offering to the Lord, but rather that a man who shall bring near of himself an offering to the Lord. 
The offering must come from within the person. In other words, when we bring that lamb without defect, when we bring that uh, grain offering without defect, when we bring that offering before the Lord, it shouldn't just be something that we're doing out of obligation. Same with our tithes and our offerings. We're not doing it because we have to do it. Right? We're doing it because it's something that comes from the inside on its way out. Sounds very similar to the concept and the idea uh, as we read through the scriptures of the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, that new covenant being etched upon our heart. Matthew 5, Yeshua talking about the internal and external commands and actions and how if we allow him to handle the inside, the outside will flow properly in alignment with it, in alignment with scripture. And so when this animal within man that must be brought near uh, is brought, and, and very literally, right, we are animals, and biologically speaking, Speaking, science says we are animals, just like a lion, a tiger, a bear, oh my, we are all animals, right? But there's an inner animal, an inner beast, right? That, that sinful nature that exists that must be brought before the Lord with that offering, and that offering come from within, and it's to be elevated uh, in, uh, by the divine fire upon the altar. So it's not just a literal sacrifice or offering being brought, but it's something from within with that. So that animal or that grain or whatever it is is being offered on the physical flame in front of us on the altar, but then there's also that inner offering that goes with it that's being offered up in the spiritual, as a spiritual offering in the divine fire, the divine flame as well. I think this is a key reality to wrestle with and one that I think uh, I often, um, uh, that, that often we're not cognizant of the effects that it may have on our lives. Obviously, the Torah is very blatantly discussing here, in a very literal sense, physical sacrifices, right? So animal, grain, and the such being offered in the tabernacle and then later in the temple. But I believe there's a, a much deeper, far greater reality being discussed here. And I think this quote from the Hasidic masters is a powerful reality, right? A man who shall bring near of himself or near of you an offering. The offering must come from within the person. Today there is no tabernacle and there's no temple standing, but we still have offerings and sacrifices that we bring to the Lord in our praise and worship, in our prayer life, in our discipleship practices, in our communal and personal worship, and so on. With that said, there is a spiritual reality to what I want to focus on today, not specifically on the sacrifices themselves, but in, a partic in particular something that we see actually at the end of this week's Parsha, in Parsha Vayichra. Um, so let's take a look at this passage now. If you have a TLV or a KG, uh, TLV or a CJB or something like that, it's going to be uh, chapter 5, verse 20 through 26. If you have a typical English translation, it's going to be 6, 1 through 7. On the screen, it's going to say 6, 1 through 7. Don't let it confuse you. That's just because the program that we use uh, uses the typical English, trans English numbering, no matter what translation we're using. So Leviticus 6, 1 says, Then Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Suppose anyone sins and commits a faithless act against Adonai, by dealing falsely with his neighbor in a matter of a deposit or a pledge of hands or through robbery or has extorted from his neighbor or has found that uh, he was lost and lied about it, swearing falsely, so sinning in one of the many in one of any uh, of these things that a man may do, then it will be when he has sinned and has become guilty that he must be that he must restore what he took by robbery and when he got by and what he got by extortion or the deposit that was committed to him or what was lost that he found or anything about which he has sworn falsely he is to restore it in full and add a fifth part more to it he must give it to the one to whom it belongs on the day of presenting his trespass offering he is to bring the trespass his trespass offering to Adonai a ram without blemish uh, fr from the flock without, uh, according to your value for a trespass offering to the Kohen. The Kohen shall make atonement for him before Adonai and he, is, he will be give, forgiven concerning whatever he may have done to become guilty. Notice that Parsha Vayichra lays out for us five primary types of offerings brought to the tabernacle as we mentioned a few moments ago and just as a, a quick refresher for you if you want to write these down and go back and look at them a little deeper these five again are the Ola or the ascending offering the Micha or the mill offering the shelima, uh, Shelamim the peace offering the Chatat which is the sin offering and the Asham or guilt offering and if I said that too fast for you uh, talk to me later on and, and I can text them to you so you can look at them a little deeper but this final section of the Parsha that we just read uh, Leviticus 5 20 through 26 or 6 1 through 7 deals with restitution when we wrong others what's interesting is the, pre the procedure for fixing these relationships 
First, you must restore whatever you messed up. Then you must add a fifth of the value to it. And then beyond that, once you've made restitution uh, and hopefully reconciliation, you must bring an offering to the priest at the tabernacle to make atonement for your sin against your brother. But equally important is the greater concept at hand here. Why is it even an issue that we need to fix things when we wrong others? And sure, obviously the, the text at hand is, is uh, dealing with more uh, of an issue of like taking something that doesn't belong to you, like you find a $20 bill on the ground that somebody in front of you dropped and you saw them drop it and you pick it up, stick it in your pocket anyways and walk on instead of giving it back to them, right? There, there's a very physical application being spoken of here. But also it goes quite a bit deeper than this as well. The reason why repairing these relationships is so important is because it, it isn't just wrong, uh, wronging or insulting against the other person. No, the Parsha clearly states that doing so is a wrong against Hashem himself as well. Again, Leviticus 6.2 starts out by saying, suppose anyone sins and commits a faithless act against Adonai. Doesn't say against somebody else, and by the way, it hurts God's feelings too, right? It begins by saying, suppose anyone sins and commits a faithless act against Adonai by dealing falsely with his neighbor in a matter of a deposit or pledge of hands or through robbery, etc. As a matter of fact, Rabbi Akiva asks, why does the Torah consider him to have committed, quote-unquote, a betrayal against God? And to this, Rashi uh, responds, because in defrauding his fellow, he is also defrauding the third party to the deal their dealings. Now, likewise, I think there is another spiritual angle to look at as well as, uh, when we consider how our acting faithless against our brothers and our sisters would also be considered acting faithless against God himself as well. Bereshit, Genesis, tells us that we are created in the image and likeness of the Lord, and we are breathing the breath of life which comes directly from God. Each of us, in fact, whether believers in Yeshua or not, each of us carry some of God in us, and are acting faithlessly toward our brother or sister is in turn a direct act of faithlessness against God. This becomes an even bigger issue when we consider acting faithlessly towards those in the body of Messiah because there is a literal presence of the Lord in our lives and the presence and the power of the Ruach HaKodesh of His Holy Spirit. Another consideration is the power of unity. When we wrong others, we, in essence, are sowing discord and disunity and division into our mix. We damage or destroy relationships. We harm and leave wounds and scars that can be difficult to overcome. There's, um, I highly doubt that there's a single person listening to what I'm saying right now who has not been in one way or another wronged or hurt by another believer over the course of their life in some way or another. And along with that, most of us are still hurting from those wounds ourselves. Most of us still find ways to try to kind of protect ourselves from being wounded by others, uh, walk around with a, a guard up all the time to make sure that somebody can't step on our toes or break our heart or damage us. We don't let people in easily, and even when we do, we're just kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. And I can tell you, like, I'm not speaking to the choir here. This is something that I deal with and experience as well. This is something I think, honestly, if we're honest about it, each and every one of us deal with this in one way or another. Because someone in the past acted faithfully against us, which created disunity, we are constantly afraid someone else is going to do the same to us again. So we continue to foster disunity under the guise of some mental and emotional force field. And before we get all wrapped up in self-righteousness, I also highly doubt that there's a single per person listening to this message right now who has not in one way or another acted faith faithlessly toward another believer. Right? It's not just that we may have been wrong, but we have wronged others as well, or toward anyone else for that matter. We've all wronged, hurt, and wounded people. I know I'm guilty of this. I can think of a thousand ways I've probably hurt or wounded someone because of something I've said or done. My typical lack of filter and unwavering sarcasm has likely caused many opportunities where I have acted faithlessly towards someone. And as we see in Leviticus 6, it is not just acting faithlessly towards that person or persons, but towards God himself as well. And I'm willing to bet as I am speaking, many of you are contemplating specific circumstances in which you're confident 
you have been done in the same, uh, done the same thing to others, or it has been done to you. And heck, some of you are probably sitting here thinking, Rabbi did this to me, and this to me. And, uh, but, but notice the key to this passage in Parsha Vayichra is not about focusing on the wrongs themselves, right? But instead, it's about focusing on restoration, on reconciliation, on unity. Just as unity can be broken, it can and should be unified again. I believe fervently that this concept of restitution and restoration when we wrong our brother or sister is an integral part of what discipleship looks like. As I've mentioned numerous times and discussed in depth in Spirit and Truth, uh, we live in what has been called a post-truth era, meaning that there isn't a common view of a finite truth anymore. Most people outside of the body of Messiah, and, and, and honestly, even some within the body of Messiah, really don't buy into this idea of a finite truth anymore. How often have we heard, even in recent years and months, people saying things like, well, that's my truth, or you need to share your truth. Well, there's only one truth, right? Either it did or it didn't. That's the only option. There, there, there is only one truth. Whereas as believers, you and I believe in certain finite truths that we believe are non-starting points, right? They, They can't be out of the mix. These have to be reality or we lose the grounding on which we stand in trusting in the word of God. First, God created all. God created man and woman. Yeshua was healed Yeshua has healed the deaf and the blind as we read throughout the Besorah. Yeshua was resurrected from the dead. Yeshua will return again for his bride, and so on and so forth. All of these are finite truths, and without them, our faith is in nothing. But do our lives always line up with the Word of God? See, this post-truth era that we live in, people are watching us, right? Right? We can talk the gospel all day long. We can talk Torah. We can talk the Bible all day long. But talk doesn't matter if our lives aren't in alignment with what we're saying. People today will look straight through us because they're going to see their lives are wrecked. And you know what? We're over here telling them how their lives can be fixed, but our lives are wrecked too. And they see that, and they can, they can recognize it. And it discredits the message we are bringing because rather than walking in healing and wholeness and unity that is available to us through the sacrifice of Yeshua and the presence of the Ruach HaKodesh, we walk in the brokenness that humanity has been rooted in since the fall of Adam and Chava of Adam and Eve rather than walking in the wholeness provided through Messiah. And the world around us sees this and they hear us talking a good talk, but they don't necessarily see it in our lives when they're watching our walk. When the body of Messiah is broken and hurt, When it is in disunity and divided, then the world around us is not seeing the word of God in our midst. We are telling them one thing, but then they are seeing something completely different. And believe me, all eyes are on the body of Messiah right now. Every eye in the world is on the body of Messiah. Think of how many scandals have broken and thrown pie in the face of the body of Messiah in recent years and even recent months. How many major names in the body have fallen in very public ways? The world sees this. They recognize it, and they're calling us on it. This is very much true when we look at uh, things on the smaller scale as well. Take, for instance, our own congregation here at CMC. The outside world is watching us. And whether whether they know it or not, they really, really want to see God in our midst. Even if they don't yet believe that there is a God. They really want to see God in our midst. They really want to know that he exists and that he loves them and that he has in fact provided salvation and forgiveness for them. But so often we act faithlessly toward each other and our own communities and we hurt our brothers and sisters within our congregation. We hurt people outside of our community. But how often do we go out of our way to make restoration and reconciliation a priority? But wasn't this idea of restoration and unity at the core of how Yeshua taught his disciples to begin with? When we look at Matthew 5, beginning with verse 23, we read, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering upon the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. 
Notice here, Yeshua is upholding what we just read in Parsha Vayichra, in Leviticus uh, 5, 20-26, and Leviticus 6, 1-7, through 7, depending on what translation you're reading. He is upholding it. Go and fix the relationship. Go and fix the problem you've caused. Then come back and make your offering. But don't try to do it without a whole heart involved in what's going on. But do we truly live this out? Do we actually uphold Yeshua's instructions here day in and day out? How many times have we come to synagogue to worship the Lord, to lift up our spiritual offering before Him, while we know good and well that we said or did something that hurt our brother or sister sometime in the week? How often that person is probably in the same exact room that we are in, at the same exact time, trying to offer up their worship too. But Yeshua makes it clear that reconciliation and restoration are key and integral parts of discipleship. Paul hits on this issue as well, but from a slightly different angle as we read in Ephesians 4, uh, verse 1. And of course, now is when it decides it doesn't want to act properly. Uh, Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, uh, I, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you were called with complete humility and gentleness, with patience, putting up with one another in love. Let me repeat that again. Putting up with one another in love. Not putting up with one another because we have to. Not putting up with one another because we don't have a better choice at hand. Putting up with one another in love. Making every effort to keep the unity of the Ruach in the bond of Shalom. There is one body and one Ruach just as you also were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one immersion, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Unity is a major part of the success of the body of Messiah, but so often we are broken and divided. Heck, there are literally thousands of denominations all divided because we haven't learned putting up with one another in love. I personally have witnessed congregations that experienced splits because half the congregation didn't like the choice of the color of carpet that went down. Or they didn't like the, you know, the hymnals, right? You can have 40 different versions of the exact same hymnal. They just have a different color, right? And I've seen congregations split. Literally, I have talked to pastors and watched what happened because they changed the hymnal color for whatever reason. And people didn't like the new color. The words are exactly the same. Nothing changed except the color of the cover. And people didn't like it. And it caused division and brokenness in their midst. Division and disunity are almost always rooted in someone acting faithless towards someone else and not working towards restoration, reconciliation, and unity in Messiah. But it is also important to remember that often we allow the wrongs others have done towards us to take up way too much of our headspace as well. We allow other people's actions to live rent-free in our brains for no reason at all. Just as important to unity uh, is me seeking and you seeking restoration and reconciliation after someone has wronged you. See, this is very much a part of it because we must forgive others as well. When somebody wrongs us, we must forgive them. It's not just me wronging you, coming to you and saying, hey, I'm sorry, can we fix this? But if I never get around to that, for instance, one of the, the sacrifices that's discussed in Parsha Vayichra is for when we don't know if we sinned. Maybe we did. We don't remember. We, just to be on the safe side, we're going to go cover our high just to be okay, right? Maybe I don't realize that I stepped on your toes and hurt your feelings. But there's a need for forgiveness anyways. And sometimes we have to go to the other person and say, hey, you may not even realize this happened. But look, this is where you hurt me. This is what was said. And I'm not coming to you to cause problems or to make you upset or to hurt your feelings. I'm coming to you because I love you and I know you love me. And I want to be reunited completely without all of this weighing over me that may even not be weighing on you, but it's weighing on me. And here's the kicker. We're to forgive them, whether they ask for it or not, whether they apologize or not. And I think that's the hard part. We allow ourselves to get so focused on how someone else stepped on our toes and then they had the audacity not to apologize. How dare they not come to me and fix this? And we get angry and we hold on to that wound and then we allow the wound to fester and to continue to think about it and continue to get more and more angry about it. But Yeshua makes it clear that forgiveness is as crucial 
as seeking forgiveness. In Matthew 6, verse 9 through 15, we read, and this is important because this is the, what's called the Lord's Prayer, right? We, we call this the Lord's Prayer all the time. We say it in our service every single week. Matthew 6, 9. Therefore, pray in this way. Our Father in heaven, sanctified be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then some manuscripts had the last little bit for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen, right? But everybody loves to stop short there. We love to re repeat that prayer. We don't really want to focus on that forgive others of you for, as they've forgiven me thing. But we'll say it, but we stop short. Because the next verse makes us really, really uncomfortable. For if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your transgressions. How often do we process these words? Now, that's not to say that when we ask the Lord to forgive our sins that He's not going to, right? God's just making it a point. As much as I have given you grace and mercy and love and forgiveness, how dare you have the audacity not to extend that to someone else, right? The Lord's not saying, I'm not going to forgive you. He's not saying because you didn't forgive someone, you're going to burn in hell. But what he is saying is, how dare you take for granted what I have done for you so freely and out of so much love and not return and extend that to someone else. Again, in Ephesians 4, Paul hones in on this same issue from Ephesians 4, 25. Uh, Jesse, if you'd move that forward for me. So lay aside lying and each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, nor give the devil a foothold. Uh, it's the next package of slides. The one who steals must steal no longer. Instead, he must work, do something useful with his own hands, so he may have something to share with the one who has need. Let no harmful word come out of your mouth, but only what is beneficial and building others up, for building others up according to the need, so that it gives grace to those who hear it. Do not grieve the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and quarreling and slander, along with all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God and Messiah also forgave you. Now, I don't say any of this about forgiveness to say that the weight of restoration and reconciliation sits on the shoulders of the victim only. Not at all. But whether the person who acted faithlessly towards us ever apologizes or seeks reconciliation with us or not, we cannot afford to carry the anger, the resentment, and the pain of those wounds forever. I'm sure you've all heard it before, but the old adage goes, hurt people, hurt people. Forgiveness isn't easy, not by any means, but it's got to be easier than dying on the cross so that you and I can be forgiven. Just a little perspective. As I prepare to close, I'd like to call our worship team back up to the stage. And as they make their way up, uh, we often uh, we talk often of the concept of discipleship, and it's one of the most important aspects of being restored to what's called the Imago Dei, or the image of God. Uh, the, the, we usually talk about the, the need for time in the Bible, maybe even journaling through as we read the Bible. We talk about prayer, seeking the Lord in every area of our life and actually submitting to His will. We talk about quiet time, focus on hearing from the Lord. We focus on fasting and stewardship uh, of our resources. We talk about using our gifts and our talents for the kingdom, among other issues. But one I think is, uh, but one thing I think is often overlooked in discipleship is relationship, particularly the need for a continued effort to maintain relationship. Unity is such a powerful resource to the body of Messiah. We are so much stronger in the power of the Ruach HaKodesh when we are united than we are when we are divided. 
As a matter of fact, that is the, the crux of the song that we sang during worship, Make Us One, from uh, Yeshua's actual prayer in John. And he says uh, very blatantly, and I'm going to paraphrase this, but very blatantly, that we are to be united as the Father and the Son are united so that the world will know the Messiah is in us, so that the world will know that the Lord sent him. And if we're not united, what is the message we are sending to the world around us? As I like to say, Messiah is coming back for his bride, singular, not for his brides, plural. He's not coming back for a Messianic Jewish bride and a Gentile Christian bride. He's not coming back for a Baptist bride or a Methodist bride or an Anglican bride or a Pentecostal bride or a Catholic bride or whatever other denomination we can come up with. He is coming back for one united bride. Listen, we are human, no doubt about it. And even though Paul encourages us to be in the world but not of the world, we are still going to have moments where our fallen humanity is going to seep its way into the surface. We will have times where we are going to fly off the handle at someone. We are going to have times where we will accidentally gossip or slander or perhaps even intentionally gossip or slander someone. And we're, uh, if we're honest with ourselves, we likely more intentionally than accidentally. We're going to have times where we step on each other's toes and cause hurt wounds to our brothers and sisters and Messiah. It's inevitable. But when we have victory is when we know we've wronged someone and we handle things the biblical way. And we approach them and we work towards restoration. We make whatever restitution is necessary to bring reconciliation and restored unity. Another key area we will have victory in is when we operate in forgiveness. If we've harmed or wronged or hurt uh, if we were harmed or wronged or hurt by someone, then we must live the example Yeshua modeled for us and forgive them and let it go. Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. We can't afford to walk around wounded because hurt people hurt people. We also can't afford to walk around completely guarded and closed off because we've been hurt by others. We must not only walk in Messiah's forgiveness, we must also model Messiah's forgiveness to others. And look, I get it. None of this is particularly easy, but it is necessary. It is biblical. It is a Messiah-like love towards others. And if we have something against our brother, if we have issues we have caused or that have been caused to us, it must be addressed. Restoration and reconciliation must be sought at all times. Now, don't get me wrong, and there are absolutely scenarios in which restoration and reconciliation for the sake of the kingdom does not mean we continue to put ourselves in a place to get hurt over and over and over again by the same person that proves over and over and over again they're just going to keep doing it. Sometimes we have to forgive from a distance. We just can't allow it to become a situation in which it makes us guarded toward everyone where we can't walk in unity with our brothers and sisters. And if someone has wronged you and they have not sought you out for forgiveness and reconciliation, the reality is that it is still needed, whether we like it or not. It doesn't mean we go to others and gossip and complain about it. We don't amplify the issue by uh, being hurt people that continue to hurt people. In fact, Yeshua gives us a clear outline of how to deal with just such a situation. In Matthew 18, beginning with verse 15, it says, now, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault while you're with him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take with you one or two more so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may stand. But if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to Messiah's community. And if he refuses to listen to even Messiah's community, let him be to you as a pagan and a tax collector. But notice that Yeshua continues on this discussion to explain why this restoration is so needed for the body. Matthew 18, picking up the next verse, verse 18. Amen, I tell you, whatever you forbid on earth will have been forbidden in heaven, and what you permit on earth will have been permitted in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. 
People often take those last few verses out of context where two or three are gathered together and where two of you agree on anything on earth. We like to take those out of context. We love to throw it around in all sorts of scenarios that don't necessarily relate to what Yeshua is talking about. Not that they can't fit in other circumstances, but there's an actual contextual purpose to what Yeshua is saying. In context, it speaks to exactly what our Parsha is speaking about this week at that, the, the end of the Parsha because truthfully, res- restoration and reconciliation with our Heavenly Father is what the entire temple service was all about to begin with. And it is absolutely what Messiah's atonement is all about. So as I close, let me encourage you today. To whom much is given, much is expected. How much greater is the weight of those words in consideration of Messiah's atonement and forgiveness which has been given freely to us. We must work tirelessly for unity, for restoration, for reconciliation because the world around us needs to see Messiah active and powerful in our midst. And part of that is us being in unity, not broken, not divided. This is why we intentionally go out of our way to build relationships with churches and pastors in the area. It's because we want to have unity. They may do things a little different than we do, and we sure enough do things different than most everyone else, and that's okay. But we must work together for the kingdom of Messiah, because it's not my kingdom, and it's not their kingdom, and it's not your kingdom. It is Messiah's kingdom, and we are all a part of it, and we must work tirelessly towards unity. Forgiveness, seeking forgiveness, restoration, reconciliation, these are vital parts of discipleship that the body has overlooked, flat out ignored, or just didn't care about for far, far too long. And the world needs to see us return to a restored nature of unity as can only be done by the power and the presence of the Ruach HaKodesh so that they see Messiah in us. Avrahamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, Lord. We thank you, God, for your might, for your power, and for your presence in our lives. We thank you that you love us and cherish us so much that you have provided freedom and, uh, and redemption for us, that you have provided forgiveness against all the wrongs, for all the wrongs that we've committed against you, and that you have called us by your might and power to extend the same forgiveness and love to those around us. Father, encourage us, uplift us to seek out restoration with our brothers and sisters, to seek out unity for your kingdom, Lord, that your name be known before all because of your presence in our midst. Father, I pray right now that you draw up to the surface in each and every one of our lives anything, anything at all that is bothering us that we feel like somebody's done to us or that we know we have done to someone else so that we can go and seek out forgiveness and restoration, so that we can offer forgiveness and restoration, so that we can live out the example of Messiah in our mishpacha and in the world around us as a whole. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. And everyone says, Amen. Worship with us for a moment.